God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Well, I've been talking about war this weekend, this new kind of war, and the old war. Now, I realize that the, uh, the subject of war is not the most uh, pleasing to a lot of people. It may make you a little bit, that approach may make you a little bit uncomfortable, some of you. Um, I apologize for that. I don't want to make you uh, uncomfortable. Then again, I do. <laughs> you know, that's the paradox of the whole thing. Uh, it, it's real. It's very, very real. Let me read to you uh, a passage which I'm, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of times I've read this in my ministry as a preacher and priest from St. Saint, Saint Paul, sixth chapter of his letter to the Ephesians, verse 10 and following. Finally, he's kind of summing things up here. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then he says again, Therefore take the whole armor of God, Footnote, St. Paul doesn't say take half the armor of God. St. Paul doesn't say take 42% of the armor of God. He doesn't even say take most of the armor of God. He says take the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you can quench all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that utterance may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. The church has always, always spoken in terms of battle. The saints have always presented us with this picture of battle. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, which, as the Holy Father says, is a sure norm for teaching the faith, states clearly that man's life is a violent conflict. Man's life is a battle. The Church states that in her teaching. So it's not just my strange idea that presents things this way. It is true that, you know, God works with each one of us uh, in a personal way. He speaks to us in a way we understand. Now, uh, of course, God knows me very well. He created me. And from the, he knows from the beginning my beady little brain worked in that manner. I always uh, related to military things, the matters of war, even as a little boy, playing. Uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, some psychiatrist could probably tell you what's wrong with me. <laughs> and no doubt a lot of things. But uh, that's just a fact. Grace builds on nature. 
Grace builds on nature, you know. God takes our nature, and then through uh, the infusion of grace, he purif purifies it. But he, he uses that. Now, you, you remember who the best friends of Jesus were. A lot of people think that they can't really handle me. Every once in a while, we, we get a lot of mail, email, so forth. 99.999% of it tr totally positive. I'm so edified by the response. Uh, it's way beyond my wildest expectations, that's for sure. But every once in a while, someone's critical, and that's okay. They, <laughs> you have a right to, to do that. Uh, they say, well, uh, your style of preaching is too much in your face. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, what can I tell you? <laughs> it is. It is. And I know, I know that that can offend the sensibilities of certain kinds of people. And I'm not, uh, that's not my intention. You know, it really isn't. I, wouldn't, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't, honestly. I don't. But um, on the other hand, I don't really care. You see, there, there's a difference. You, you know, I, I, I don't want to do it, but if it happens, that's kind of like, um, you know, um, an unplanned for effect. Uh, it's peripheral damage. You know, that, that's, it's not something we intend, but it can happen. Uh, let me tell you, an awful lot of people in the church and in the world spend most of their time worrying about who they're going to offend, and then they so mitigate, vitiate, and distort the truth that nothing comes through. They talk interminably and say nothing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> that sounds familiar. Right. Okay, I don't have time to talk that much and go nowhere. My time is short. So's yours. <laughs> so we've got a battle. All right? We've got the, we're more aware of it today. Now, I've always been talking on these themes. Those of you who know me know that I've been talking on these themes just in July. You know, I was up here and gave that spiritual warfare conference. I was talking about this. And then September 11th came. Uh, it was, no, it was a shock to me, like it was to everybody, but no surprise. No surprise. What happens is that hidden battle, periodically through history, that battle in the spiritual realm, realms, that rips through the veil, that separates the seen from the unseen, and, and the violence of the conflict becomes manifest to us. We can see it and hear it and, and feel it around us. You know, why it alters our life. Satan is the master terrorist. Satan mimics God. A Satanist turns everything upside down. He takes the truth and turns it upside down. That's called a lie. Terrorists are liars and murderers. Jesus said concerning the devil, that he is a liar and the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning. You think about it. You know, terrorists, by the way, unlike any other kind of enemy we've ever had, they don't have an, a, a real agenda, you know. This is a facade to make you think that they want uh, rights in Palestine. Or, that's a bunch of baloney. They really don't. Their end is terrorism. That's not a means for them. That is an end for them. Mayhem and murder are their stock in trade. Uh, in case any of you don't know it, if you're so naive that you really don't understand this, you cannot negotiate with Satan. You cannot negotiate with a terrorist. You can't. Take no prisoners. The only way to deal with Satan is head on and brutally. I don't make deals with the devil, and you can't make deals with terrorists. You just can't. And if we are so soft and naive as to think so, God help us. You know, there are a lot of people who don't understand that there's evil in the world. Uh, they are radical pacifists, and that sounds good, but it isn't. If radical pacifists had had their way, we'd all be speaking German or Russian by now. 
believe you me, if they had had their way in World War II, the forces of evil would have prevailed. If they would have had their way during the communist reign of terror, it would have been horrendous. And this is no different. Now, the outcome of this new kind of war will ultimately be determined by the outcome of the old kind of war. You and I can't go enlist in the Marines or the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. Most of us, some of the young people will, but most of us can't. We're beyond that. That's not our state in life. That's not what we're called to do right now. But we are called to support the war effort on both fronts. And the way you and I are called to do it is mainly as Catholics. As Catholics. We, through a vibrant spiritual life, breathe life into the body of Christ, the church. And the church, the more vibrant she is, thus breathes life into all creation. As the church corresponds to her mission, which is holiness, by the way, as the church corresponds to her main mission, holiness of life, which affects redemption, that's the mission of the church. mission of the church can't be any different than the mission of the Redeemer. He is holiness itself. He came to save the world. That's our mission. In him, we can't do it apart from him. He is the vine, we are the branches. We can do nothing without Jesus. So we have to, each one individually, play a key role in this battle. In so doing, we breathe life into the church. Now the church holds the world in being through holiness, through grace. You remember what happened in the Old Testament with Moses and the chosen people when they came into conflict with Amalek's army? Remember the account of that battle in the Old Testament? How it said Moses went up on the high ground. Where does the military commander go? He goes up on the high ground. Moses, the leader, went up on the high ground, and it says as long as Moses held his arms outstretched in prayer, the battle went well for Israel. That's a type, biblical type of the church. But when Moses, now Moses was a man, uh, Moses grew weary. When Moses became tired and his arms drooped down, he couldn't hold them up in prayer, the battle went badly for Israel. And so it says then that they propped up Moses' arms. They held his arms up in prayer, and Israel prevailed. As long as the church holds her arms up in prayer, as long as we are faithful to our mission of holiness, the battle will go well. Old kind of battle, new kind of war. As long as we pray unceasingly, we'll do all right. But if we grow weary of goodness, if we grow weary of justice, if we grow weary of truth, if we grow weary praying and our, our arms sag, watch out. For then evil gains power. I remember a story the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen related he was traveling during Lent. He was on an airplane, like I always am, during Lent and most of the rest of my life. And he recalled how when they came with dinner, he decided he wouldn't, he wouldn't take the dinner. He'd fast a little bit for Lent. And so he said, no, thanks, I, I won't take dinner. And the girl next to him, very nice-looking young woman sitting next to him on the plane, said, oh, well, I won't take dinner either. And he kind of perked up and said, oh, are you Catholic as well, fasting for Lent? And she said, no, uh, I am a witch fasting for abortions. And then she spent the next couple of hours telling him the truth. And it was a revelation to him. That great, uh, educated, articulate man, the greatest preacher of the 20th century, got an education in spiritual combat. There is a flip side to good. Everything that we do in this battle for good and truth, everything noble, everything pure, 
Everything powerful for the cause of the kingdom has a reverse side. The enemy does the same thing. They fast. They do the equivalent of pray, evil as it is. They use incantations that they repeat over and over. Prayer formulas. Sacrifice. The same thing in reverse. Yeah, we're at war, all right. And the way the spiritual war goes determines what happens in the world. Now, we've been set up for the current circumstances. You think this just happened? Bad luck or something? Ha! Huh. This has been coming for a long time. Do you think gross evil and immorality goes its merry way without consequences in the world? I assure you it does not. Do you think 10 million plus abortions a year do not bring in their wake horrible consequences for the world? I assure you it brings horrible consequences for the world and you haven't seen anything yet. This is the barest beginning. And so do not wonder when hell breaks loose over all the earth. For it has been long in coming, and it is now upon us. The flames have been ignited. I will not be surprised at anything from this point on. Satan is a terrorist. Capital T. His business is lying, murder, and mayhem. That is his end. That is his object, not a means to achieving an end. Please understand that difference. He's not trying to achieve a political end. His end is murder. He is a liar. The reason he lies is because he's a murderer from the beginning. Death entered the universe through a lie. And that's why Jesus called him a liar, father of lies, murderer from the beginning. This spiritual war has to be fought in earnest. In every war, there are weapons and tactics. I remember having many classes in the Army on weapons and on tactics. Before I was injured, um, I was in the, the grunt part of the Army. You know, you've heard of grunt soldiers. They're, they're the ones who carry weapons and go fight the wars. That's how I started out, although I... I was injured and didn't, I, I never killed anybody, thank God, even in battle. Uh, I count that as a blessing. I would have. I would have. I was, I was a soldier, and I would have, but I never did. And I count that as a great blessing from God. He preserved me from that. But you have weapons, and you had to learn about your weapons. Now, I had always handled weapons since when I was eight years old. So I didn't, it wasn't a new thing when I went in the Army. Now, I grew up right on the edge of the country, and shotguns and rifles were as normal uh, where I grew up. It's northern Michigan, same thing, you know. Uh, the approach of deer season was holiday time. Oh, I took away, I, I disappeared from school. <laughs> With permission. In some places, they actually cancel school on opening day of, of the deer season. <laughs> there are actual places in the good old United States where, they, well, it's a, it's a tradition. Families handed it on. It's wholesome. There's nothing wrong with it. But I, I, so I grew up in the woods. That's why I was never afraid when we had to do those things like that escape and evasion. So I, I, it was home for me. So it was not, you know, uh, sleeping in a tree uh, or under one. It was no big deal. When I was young, I could go out in the swamp, walk 30 miles a day, uh, lie down on the bare ground, sleep, get up 4 o'clock in the morning, shake myself off like an old dog, and do it all over again. Isn't it wonderful to be young? <laughs> Some of us are beginning to forget <laughs> what that was like. <laughs> but we learned about weapons in the Army. I was a uh, that was my area of specialization for a while when I started out. I remember they introduced us to the M16 rifle, and they give you a, 
a spiel that they hadn't memorized. I'm going to do that, but, but when I perfect this talk, you know, all my talks are, are on the way. None of them have arrived. They're all being perfected. And when I perfect this, when I'll, I'm going to read that and I'm going to memorize that spiel. The M16 rifle is a, an automatic rifle, has such and such a capacity and fires at a cyclic rate of fire, blah, blah, blah. They used to rattle that off. You know, they had it memorized. In other words, the point is we knew our weapons. They would blindfold you or put you in a totally dark room and you'd have to take it apart right down to the small parts, field strip it. And then you'd have to put it back together. In other words, you had to know all those parts by feeling them in the dark. That's how familiar you had to be with your weapon. And you had to do with the enemy's weapon, not just your own. All right, this is the class on weapons and tactics, short version. I gave you a hint last night. See? That is the preferred small arm. of God's army, led by the field commander, your mama, who wears combat boots. Don't go into the field without it, and pray it every day. Now, I've been saying this since the day I started preaching. Now it has new meaning. After the events of September 11th, the Holy Father has said solemnly to every Catholic in the church all over the world, pray the rosary every day. Now, like a good subordinate, like a good troop obeying his superior, I'm telling you what he's told all of us. Pray the rosary every day. And I mean it. And I'm going to tell you something. Here's how much I mean it. When you get up to the gates of heaven, if I'm there first and you're trying to get in, when I find out you didn't do it, despite the need in this war effort, I might testify against you. <laughs> and if I don't do it, you could rightly testify against me. Do it. Whether you like it or not, just Flat, do it. You say, but I don't like that form of prayer. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Why? Because it is powerful. That's why. You know, a lot of people make excuses. Oh, but I pray other ways. Usually they don't. Usually they don't in plain English. I'm going to tell you one of the greatest reasons to pray the rosary. It's simple. And it is the most highly indulgent personal prayer in the church. Pope John Paul II and the last several popes behind him have prayed 15 decades a day. Now, I've got a simple, direct question for you. Are you busier than the Pope? <laughs> then don't give me that old sorry excuse. Oh, I don't have time. I'm too busy. You're not busier than the Pope. Neither am I. I remember my great-grandfather on my mother's side. When we go to visit him, he was a, a carpenter, lived in the French-speaking part of Canada in Quebec. And every night after supper, he would lead the family in the rosary. Now, great-grandfather was not a very big man. He was probably five, I don't know, five foot seven, five foot six. But he was a very powerful built man, like a blacksmith. And I tell you, I can't even, even now, with about 50 years of distance between me and great-grandfather, I can't even fathom facing him and saying, I don't want to pray the rosary, great-grandpa. <laughs> now, that was in the good old days. You did it. He was the leader. He was the officer. He was the commander-in-chief of his family. He wasn't a brute. He wasn't a tyrant. But I'll tell you what, he was the boss in his family. And when, when great-grandfather said, well, now give honor to God by praying Our Lady's Rosary, by golly, everybody was on their knees, and right now, too. And when the kids and the grandkids grew up and were an adults, and you went to great-grandfather's house on a holiday or for supper, I'll guarantee you, you were praying the rosary, and there was no question, no possible question, that it would be otherwise. 
That was a different kind of man in a different kind of time. And I want you to remember how much more wholesome that time in history was. We've become soft and weak and uncommitted, wishy-washy, not strong, weak. And because of it, the very moral fabric of our society has been weakened. We need to take back lost ground. Why is the rosary powerful? It is the prayer of the gospel. Now, I've given this talk many times. Now, the rosary, you look at it. It's got a soul and a body like a human being. The soul gives life to the body. The soul is the animating force of the body. Soul of the rosary, meditation on the 15 mysteries. What are they? Annunciation, visitation, nativity. Where do we find all those mysteries? In the gospel. What about the prayers? Our Father, Hail Mary. Right out of the gospel. You know, I have, I have many Protestant friends who pray the rosary, including pastors. They cannot refute the simple logic that the prayer of the rosary is the prayer of the gospel. What's the gospel? It means good news. The word means good news. What's the good news? The good news is Jesus. The good news is not merely something. The good news is somebody. Jesus is his name. Pray the rosary, you pray the gospel. Pray the gospel, you pray Jesus. You interiorize him, you become who you are, the body of Christ, empowered to do what he did, to go about doing good, healing the sick, giving hope to the hopeless, delivering from the grip of evil those who are terrified by it. Oh, it's the power of the rosary. I have said a million times, if there's only one thing you could do, pray the rosary. And why do I say that? Because I know for a fact that if you do that, you will then do everything else you're supposed to do. Because the grace it brings down will bring you to confession. It'll bring you to mass. It'll bring you to read the Bible. It'll bring you to study the catechism. It'll bring you to make the holy hour in front of Jesus in the Eucharist. Pray the rosary, and you will have power in your life. There are other weapons. Truth is a powerful Weapon. Now we all, you know, there, there is a, in the armed forces, there is a rank called specialist. You know, very often you have a specialist uh, fourth class, specialist fifth class, and so forth. It's like sergeant and so forth. They're ranks in the army. Well, uh, I'm a specialist in a sense in the church. In my area of specialization, my MOS, my military occupational specialty, is truth. That's what I have done from the beginning. Preachers, if they are truly preachers, deal with the truth. They are to take the truth, which is God himself, and they are to simply teach that which is purely simple, eternal truth. God, by definition, is truth. God, by definition, is pure simplicity. To teach the truth simply, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's my occupational specialty in God's army. The truth is a powerful weapon. It strikes right at the heart of the enemy. What's his major weapon? Lies. Why? Murder. Especially spiritual, moral murder. To extinguish the life of grace in the soul. That's what the enemy's about. Now, by using the truth, by speaking it, by living it, most of all, we strike right at the heart of the enemy. We cut his head off. You can't negotiate with a terrorist. You cut his head off, and then he can't hurt you. And that's the only way you can deal with Satan. I take no prisoners when it comes to the devil. It's head-on combat. You either kill or be killed in that moral spiritual war. And truth, as St. Paul said, take up the sword, the two-edged sword of the word of God, which is the truth. That is a powerful, powerful weapon. The only thing I have done since the day I was ordained, and I didn't choose to do it, I was sent to do it by my superiors. Do you know what the word apostle means? To be sent. 
comes from the Greek verb apostolon, to be sent. An apostle is sent. You don't send yourself. I didn't call myself, and I didn't send myself. My superiors discerned and confirmed my call, and they sent me. I will never forget the Holy Father after he ordained me a priest. When he came around, he met all 62 of us that he had just ordained. Right in front, it was at St. Peter's, the Vatican, right in front of the Pieta. He came, we were in a circle, and the Holy Father came and greeted each one of us, and he talked with us a little bit in our own language. Amazing man, Pope John Paul II. And he said to me, where are you from? I said, the United States. Uh, are you studying? Yes, Holy Father, I'm studying University of Navarre. Ah, uh, what level? Doctorate level. Uh, you have a thesis. Yes, Holy Father. What is your thesis? My thesis is the theology of the cross and the magisterium of John Paul II. And he smiled. And he said, you must send me a copy. And I did. And then he said, before he went on, he said, yes, yes, America. You must go back to America where I need you. I took it personally. And ever since then, my mission, my weapon, has been the truth. That's one of the weapons in the arsenal, and a powerful one. I have preached in front of hundreds of thousands of people in my last, the last 10 years. I've been a priest 10 years this year. May, 20, May, May, Trinity Sunday, I celebrated my 10th anniversary this past year. The truth is a powerful weapon. Yes, I come to conferences like this. Yes, I'm on radio. Yes, I'm on television. And we use the means of social communication. Just a little side note. More weapons. The sacramentals. Medals, crucifixes, rosaries, blessed salt, blessed water, blessed oil, and so forth. Those are sacramentals. Two essential parts of a sacramental, like a sacrament. They're not sacraments, but similar in the sense they have two essential parts. There's a prayer of blessing, and then there's the material that you bless. Just like in a sacrament, you have form and matter. You have the form of the sacrament, the words. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The matter, the water, immersion, pouring, form and matter. In the sacramental, you have the prayer. Now, this summer, July, I blessed <laughs> gallons of water. They went out and they bought all the salt in the county, I, I believe it was. They, they literally went out and bought cases and cases of salt. Now, the, the modern mind thinks that's hogwash and nonsense. But the modern mind, I have to tell you, is benighted. The modern mind, with respect to spiritual things, is often undiscerning, uneducated, unintelligent. Sacramentals are a part of the church's arsenal. We're to use them. Listen, if the army provides the soldiers with good weapons and they don't use them, whose fault is that? That's the stupidity of the soldier. And then if he gets wiped out in battle, it's his own fault. Bless salt. The old form of the old prayer for salt, almost everything was an exorcism prayer. Wherever that material was placed, that prayer was placed. It's not magic. But it's mystical, and there's a difference between the two. Holy water, you have water, that's material. You, you sprinkle it around, and the prayer that's said over it is placed wherever that water goes, wherever the salt goes. Okay? Uh, you might sprinkle salt outside around your house. I did do it around my house. I put a little bit in, in, in my car. It lasts longer. The material is there longer. It's not magic. It, it's not, it's not going to absolutely prevent the evil one from attacking you. Listen, if the devil beats you up or gives you trouble, wear it as a badge of honor. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't um, assault his friends. He only assaults his enemies. And so if you're in a battle most of your life, praise the Lord. But use the weapons. The sacraments, 
The seven sacraments are big, they're like artillery. The seven sacraments are major weapons, powerful weapons. Uh, they enter into the Paschal mystery and make present the infinite grace of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. You've got the sacraments of initiation, baptism, Eucharist, and confirmation. They, they bring you into the fullness of Christ. They give you sanctifying grace. I'm going to give you the simple definition. definition. Sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. We are called to a supernatural end. Natural means are insufficient to achieve a supernatural end. In order to achieve your supernatural end, you need supernatural means. So, when Mary Jones comes to me and says, Oh, Father, my husband's a good man, but he doesn't go to church very much. But he's a good old boy. No cigar. Not good enough. You cannot achieve a supernatural end through merely natural means. You need sanctifying grace, you get it from the sacraments. We have sacraments of healing, because we get wounded in battle. Hmm? You've got confession or reconciliation. And you've got anointing of the sick, the two sacraments of healing. And then you've got sacraments of service. One time President Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Ask not so much what heaven can do for you, but what you can do for heaven. And you say, but what could I do for heaven? I'll tell you what, bring children to the Father. And how do you do that? Prayer and penance, sacrifice, spreading the truth, running the race to the finish line, fighting the good fight. That's what you do. And that's how you give glory to God in the battle. So use the sacraments. The sacraments of service, matrimony, and holy orders. Jesus said, I've come to serve, not to be served. If you will remember that one thing, you'll be a tremendous soldier. If you will always come as a servant, you'll be powerful with the power of God. Husbands, serve your wives. God didn't make you big boss, period. He did in a way, but the only authority is service. Please remember that. The only authentic authority in reality is the authority of service. That's the teaching of the church, in case you don't know it. That's why the Pope is called the servant of the servants of God. Wives, serve your husbands. Children, serve your parents. Parents, serve your children. Priests, serve the people. People, serve the priest. Always come as a servant. Tremendously mysterious thing will then happen. Make yourself last. Put God first, everybody else second, you last. And then what will happen is the fulfillment of a promise, a miracle. The last become first. And on that day of judgment, you will receive a reward beyond your wildest dreams. Now that is the essence of how we fight this battle tactics. You not only have weapons in war, you have tactics and strategy in war. I alluded to it last night. One of the major strategies or tactics in war is to take the high ground. In any battlefield, you want the high ground. Because if you have the high ground, you have a commanding position to dominate the countryside. It's easier to put artillery there and control that. It's much harder to take a high position. You're at a disadvantage, so you want to take the high ground. Now listen, the devil is a master tactician. He is a strategist in this war. 
He's taken a lot of high ground in the last 30, 40 years. Education and formation is the high ground. Very often the devil has taken the high ground of schools, even Catholic schools. I'll never forget Archbishop Fulton Sheen, right before he died, made the astounding statement, and this was the most respected bishop in the United States for years. He said, I tell my best friends and my family members, if you want your children to fight for the faith, send them to public school. If you want them to lose the faith, send them to Catholic school. He said that. Bishop Sheen said that back in the 70s. Why would he say such a horrible thing? Because it was flat out true in many cases, not in all cases but in many cases. Now, I am anything but politically correct. And when it comes to, oh, I'm deadly serious, that, that business of political correctness is a curse. And don't make any mistake about it. That is a curse and a pox on society and on the church. And there's just as much of it in the church as there is out of the church. And it's not politically correct to say things like that. You accuse, you'll be accused of being divisive, mean-spirited, and all those worn-out old words and tired expressions. Well, I have been there, and I have seen it, and Satan runs a lot of those programs and a lot of those schools, including seminaries and Catholic universities. Now, it's getting better, praise the Lord. But a lot of high ground was taken by the enemy. It really was. They taught garbage and called it truth. They taught immoral theology and called it moral. Oh, they said that artificial contraception is okay if it doesn't bother your conscience. A thousand of them have said that. Flat out lies and it leads to moral death. And Satan is the author and protagonist of that lie. Oh, and they've even said abortion under certain circumstances is okay. No, it's not. And they've said certain moral aberrations, certain things like masturbation and alternative lifestyle and pornography aren't so bad. Yes, they are. They rot the very moral fabric of society and the church. The church, from the top, has taught the truth faithfully. All the popes of recent years have articulated and defended the truth with heroism. We've had great leadership from the popes. But middle management has often been remiss. Middle management has often not handed on the excellent teaching we've consistently received from the Holy Father. And that is a crime that screams out to heaven for vengeance. And it is part of the reason that our society has rotted and is about to collapse if we don't change things fast. Tactics take the high ground. They got a lot of high ground, got to take it back, counterattack. Education has to be renewed and purified and restored to its noble and dignified place. What's education? An entrance into the truth. What's Catholic education? An entrance into the fullness of truth. And if you don't enter more deeply into Jesus Christ, you're not an educated person. If your education takes you away from Christ, that's an imposter to the throne. Kill the officers, and that's another tactic. That's another strategy. Take out the leaders. Priests have been attacked viciously. Priests have fallen through weakness many, many times. That's nothing new, but in recent years, it's worse than ever. I suppose the low point of it for me was the day I carried a priest half dead out of a crack house. 
the day I paid $14,000 in ransom for a religious sister in a brothel. That's right. No, I didn't read that on the front page of The Wanderer or The Washington Post. I was there. I saw it. I did it. And so nobody can tell me that these things are not real, for they are very real. And I do not condemn our wounded brothers and sisters. Oh, no. Uh, except for the grace of God, uh, I'd be worse than all of them and have been. And have been. It's not a disgrace to be wounded in battle. But it is a disgrace to desert. And so if you are wounded or someone you know is wounded, especially a bishop, a priest, religious, do not be quick to judge them. Do not condemn them. Don't engage in gossip, slander, and calumny. Pray. Pray. Do penance. Offer reparation. Help the fallen brother get up. Help the wounded sister recover. Don't finish them off. Great St. Francis of Assisi, late in life when he was already acclaimed a saint, had the stigmata, was practically blind, a man filled with suffering, went into a village. People came out to greet him as they always did. And they went in procession. They had a problem in the village. The parish priest was living in sin with a woman. He had a woman in the rectory living an immoral life. And the people were very angry. Terrible scandal. And so they figured they'd bring the saint, St. Francis, to the rectory, and he'd fix that erring priest. So they brought him, and poor St. Francis, at the end of the procession, at night with candles lit, and they knocked on the door of the rectory. And the poor man came to the door. And St. Francis looked at him through blind eyes, fell to his knees, took his hands and kissed them. He said, all I know and all I want to know is that these hands bring me Jesus. And the man was converted on the spot. He began to live a holy life, and he died a holy death. Now, that's a warrior. That's how we do battle. That's how we overcome the lies, the treachery of that master terrorist, Satan. Oh, yes. There are tactics. The enemy uses tactics. So do we. The enemy is relentless. So are we. The enemy pursues his unholy end. So do we pursue our holy end. So yes, it's a battle. We have to form a coalition. That's a strategy. That's a tactic. The enemy has formed a coalition. Hmm? The enemy has many allies in the world and in the church. He's done his work well. How he has allied himself with the media in so many cases, how he has used technology to further his ends of moral destruction. Oh, he's a very good strategist, the enemy. We have to form a coalition, too. We have allies. All the angels, all the saints, what a great cloud of witnesses spurring us on. And we have each other. And don't sell that short. That's the real value of a conference like this. You see, we've got all the leaders of God's army that come together. You say, I'm no leader. I'm just a little guy. The last will be first. And don't forget it. You perform a serious mission, an essential mission in this battle. Listen, pray for me.
And I'll pray for you, because I'm going to guarantee you something. I cannot come to the end of the road without help. I cannot get through this war without your help. I will not survive. It's too hard. This battle is too vicious. Someone like me goes out on a battlefield and has a large bullseye painted on him. You understand that? Yes, you do. You do. I need a lot of protection. I have countless thousands of people that pray for me. I have had wonderful people tell, who are dying from cancer. My own father, who suffered for years from a heart condition and a, a thousand other afflictions, offered all their suffering for my ministry. I've had several religious sisters that I don't even know who've corresponded with me and said, Father, for the last several years, I've struggled with this or that. I have bone cancer. I have several that have had bone cancer. I offer everything for your protection and for your ministry, and God wants me to do it. So rest assured that you have my help. What a humbling thing. What a humbling thing to know you have that kind of ally. And for my part, I'm not much. I can't do much. I'm poor. But I'll guarantee you, all of you are remembered in all of my masses and all of my prayers and all of my rosaries. I'm a sinner, but I know God listens to me, not through any merit or goodness of my own, but because of his goodness. And I have a broker. Mary is her name. Oh, some people have brokers for stock market stuff. Like the commercial used to say, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Well, when Mary speaks, God listens. I have my broker. And so I give her everything. And what is little becomes much. And so you have my support for whatever it's worth. Based on my merit, it's worth nothing. But based on Our Lady's intercession and help, you'll get plenty out of it. So yes, strategy. Uh, one of the strategies is to disrupt communications. The enemy tries to disrupt, disrupt our communication of the truth by distorting it. You know, they try to scramble the message. Hmm? We, we've had a scrambling of the message of truth in recent years. It's become so bad that it's been diminished and demolished in many cases. The truth has ended up being called a lie, and lies have been called the truth, an inversion of reality, a demonic turning upside down of all that is true and good. Well, we have to straighten out our communications. Once again, we have to get the message across, and we have to disrupt the enemy's communications. We are the victim these days of terrorism. Indeed, freedom and fear are at war. But if you are truly free, meaning that you're rooted in truth, meaning that if you are truly Jesus' disciples, you've accepted his word, you abide in his word, you obey his commandments, then you know the truth. And the truth makes you free. And that freedom cannot be assailed. That freedom cannot be defeated. That freedom is a wall that is impregnable. That freedom rooted and immersed and inextricable with eternal truth. The enemy can't prevail. No fear, no terror and knock down that authentic human freedom. Yes, we are at war. Yes, we have weapons. And yes, we have tactics. Every one of us is to take this seriously. Every one of us is to assume our position on the battle line. Please listen to me in this. I do not know how many more times I'll be able to get this message across. Do this. 
pray, take up the weapons, and engage in that strategy and tactics which will assure us of victory. Victory in Jesus. God bless you. God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Well, I come to the end of my road. This is my last uh, talk at this conference this year. Like my uh, grandmother used to say, time flies when you're having fun. New war, old war. Spiritual training, weapons, tactics. Our Lady, woman clothed with the sun, the moon at her feet, the crown of 12 stars on her head. And the words of Jesus, that ring out through the ages. I have come to serve, not to be served. And that's what I want to leave you with in this last few minutes or so that I have to be with you. I have often told you that when I was ordained a priest back in 1991 on Trinity Sunday, my superior and I stayed up all night in the chapel at the Vatican where we were staying. We stayed up all night praying. We would pray the rosary, and then he would talk to me uh, like a good father, giving advice to his son. And Father Jim Flanagan is so uh, very much my spiritual father. Great, great priest. Great, great man. Uh, you know, he's, he's kind of a hero, a very humble man, but I look up to him so much. Uh, he once uh, asked his mom, his father had died uh, at a rather young age. His dad was an attorney in Boston, nine children. Uh, Father Jim's brother was district attorney of Boston, probably 20 years. Had another brother, head of the philosophy department at Boston College for many years. But he once asked his mother, was dad uh, a great man? What was he really like? And his mom said, Jimmy, if you're ever half the man your father was, you will be one heck of a man. And I think he always remembered it. And he's the greatest man that I've ever met. Not just the greatest priest. He's the greatest man I've ever met. Uh, even on a human level. All-American and on the national championship, Notre Dame football team back in the 40s. Navy SEAL, many, many missions during World War II, uh, both in Europe and in the South Pacific, founded the Society of Our Lady responsible for the ordination of hundreds of priests, done great work. And we stayed up that night before my ordination, and we prayed all night long before the Blessed Sacrament. And he gave me great advice. And now, a little more than 10 years later, I can tell you, I don't remember a thing he said. <laughs> except one thing. Except one thing. Always come as a servant. That's what he said to me. Always come as a servant. And everything else that he said to me was wrapped up in that, connected to that.
intertwined with that. The words of Jesus from the gospel. The Son of Man has come to serve, not to be served. Now, how does that fit in to this war I've been talking about? It defines our mission. Defines our mission. Uh, just like President John Kennedy once said, ask not so much what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Ask not so much what heaven can do for you, but what you can do for heaven. Come as a servant. Now that's easy to say, hard to do at times. I look out at a lot of wonderful married couples. Some of you have been married a good long time. And you know the meaning of in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. You know the meaning of those words better than anybody else. Husbands and wives know what it means to be servants. Now I'm going to give you the secret of happiness right now. So let those who have ears hear, and let those who have eyes see. As things heat up in the world, as I assure you they will, the fire has already been started. The flames are already in progress. But as things get worse, I'm going to tell you how to be at peace. Always come as a servant. Wives, when you approach your husband, your attitude toward your husband, come as a servant. And while you may think that that's beneath you, and now husbands, I'm talking to you as well. Hmm? That's this. This is. Equal opportunity sermon. <clears throat> wives serve your husbands, and husbands serve your wives. Listen, if Jesus did it, who the heck are we not to? If it was, if, if Jesus humbled himself, accepting the form of a slave, now very often in contemporary translations of Scripture, we, uh, we lose some of the meaning of the original. <clears throat> now, in those particular translations where we often see the word servant, that's a, a, a mild term. The real word in uh, Koine Greek, the language of the New Testament, was doulos. And it means slave. It means slave. Our Lady, the humble slave of the Lord. Handmaid is more benign. Handmaid doesn't offend our contemporary sensibilities as much. A slave, that has a bad connotation in our culture. So we don't use it. But the real word in the New Testament was slave. Generally speaking, slaves do hard things and dirty things. Slaves do things nobody else wants to do. And Jesus said, I have come to serve and not to be served. And it was in the context of that word, doulos, slave. If you come always as a servant, you really can never be disappointed. Now, I remember as clear as though it were yesterday, the vigil of Trinity Sunday, staying up with my superior, praying all night, and I can hear his words, come always as a servant. And then the next day, I was ordained a priest 
by the Pope. 10,000 people, and I have often thought of it as my wedding day. You know, you married people remember your wedding day. <clears throat> well, in an analogous way, uh, priests are married too. We have a, a vow of celibacy, of course. I don't mean uh, married in a physical sense. But Jesus is called the bridegroom in Scripture. Uh, Jesus is the high priest. And every priest who is ordained is taken up in Christ, the high priest. So, Jesus, the bridegroom, and who's his bride? The church. The beautiful bride of Christ. And so there I was at St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. Trinity Sunday, May 26, 1991. The Pope ordains me a priest. I floated out of the basilica. And for months, I would wake up in the middle of the night out of a dead sleep saying, I'm a priest. I'm a priest. Thank God. I'm a priest. I couldn't believe it. Neither could most of heaven. <laughs> and it was wonderful. I loved being a priest. I loved to celebrate Mass. I loved to give Holy Communion to the faithful. I loved to hear confessions. I just loved preaching. I loved being a priest. And my bride, wow, what a beautiful mystical bride. Jesus gave me his own bride. And then the honeymoon ended. <laughs> As it always does. And early one morning, after a fitful night of sleep, it was kind of like I woke up. I looked over. And I said, ah, what have I done? You don't look as good as you used to, bride. I work and I slave my fingers to the bone. You don't appreciate me. Sound familiar? You've been there and done that. As the years go on, and the gloss of mere emotions wear thin, as chemistry is replaced by reality, we find out that indeed you got to come as a servant. You've got to come always as a servant. This is the way Jesus fought the war. This is the way that he overcame the power of evil. Remember how evil came to be. Pride, disobedience, death. The offset, humility, obedience, life. Come always as a servant. In order to be a servant, you've got to be humble. Like the, the gospel said today, take the lowest place at the wedding feast, that the master might call you up higher, and you win the respect of all the other people at the wedding feast. Catholics, Catholics, should be very different from the rest of the world. Catholics should not only be faithful to their religion, Catholics should not only be zealous for the faith, Catholics should be the best at everything. Catholics should be the best physicians. Catholics should be the best doctors. Catholics should be the best lawyers, accountants, 
butchers, bakers, candlestick makers. Catholics should be the best. Why? Says in the Bible, whatever we do, we do for the Lord. Now, if you're doing it for the Lord, how good should it be? Mom, when you cook dinner, who are you cooking for? Jesus or the old man? <laughs> the old man can wear you out. And the old man is human. And he may not thank you. And it may seem like he doesn't appreciate you, even though he does. He's human. Jesus, however, is not only true God, but true man. He's fully human. And so whatever you do for the Lord is never lost. I remember a story uh, a religious sister told me. She was novice mistress of the Missionaries of Charity at their novitiate in San Francisco, and I preached a retreat to them a while back, Sister Lysa, who's now second counselor uh, next to uh, Sister Nirmala, who's third from the top now over in Calcutta. She told me they had, when they got the, the building, the convent, <clears throat> Mother came to, was going to come and inspect. Now, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, in case you don't know it, had an eminently military mind. Uh, Mother Teresa was a commander-in-chief. The first time I went to the convent in San Francisco, I, they, they took me in the room where I stayed, where I came in and out of to preach, where I rested, took my meal. <clears throat> it reminded me of the war room in the Army that I remembered from the 1960s. Big map of the world, and it had pins hundreds of pins. And I said, what are all those pins in the world? And they said, well, that, that's, that's every place we occupy territory. <laughs> We've got over 500 houses all over the world, over 5,000 sisters serving the poorest of the poor. And although it looks like there's a lot of pins up there, the way Mother looks at it, she says, look at all that space without pins. <laughs> We've got to occupy enemy territory. We've got to come as servants. If you come as a servant, it's a lot easier not to be disappointed. If you come as a servant, it's a lot easier not to be offended when people do not respect you accept you, or appreciate you. Come always as a servant. We know the word authority. There's authority in the church. Sometimes, like all spheres of human existence, authority has been abused in places in the church as well as in the world. The Holy Father has articulated very clearly in recent years, that the only authentic authority in the church and in the world is the authority of service. That's why the Holy Father is called the servant of the servants of God, his highest title, by the way. Do you want to know the highest form of service? That is the highest form of authority. The greatest authority is the authority of service. The highest form of service, crucifixion. Mom knows about that. So does dad. So does the pastor. So does everyone who serves others. Who's called to serve others? Everybody. The hierarchy, we have a hierarchy. God first, everybody else second, me last. Easy to say, 
hard to do. That is a blueprint, however, for victory. Please remember that. That's a blueprint for victory. I look at the Holy Father these days, and I see a very tired, sick, long-suffering servant of the servants of God. For many, many decades, he has had no time of his own. He belongs to the church. He's a gift for the church. A lot of people don't like him. A lot of people didn't like Jesus. You can't please everybody, but you can serve everybody. Sometimes... The more faithfully you serve, the more you will be crucified. I've only been a priest 10 years. Not very long. And I'm already almost an old guy. But in that 10 years, I have never been so conscious of being loved and hated. Never in my life. And I did a lot in my life before. I know about athletics. I know about the military. I know about business. I've been there and done that, all of it. Never until I was ordained a priest was I so conscious of intense love and intense hatred. Never in all the days when I was hustling in the business world did anybody ever spit on me. Never in all my days hustling money did anybody ever threaten to kill me. I had to be ordained first to get that privilege. Literally. The only joy, the only peace that you will ever have is giving yourself to others. You try to hold on it, to it, you'll lose it. You'll lose it, you lose your life. For his sake, you'll gain it. You try to hang on, do things for yourself, be egocentric, you'll lose everything. You will be impoverished. Jesus, though he was rich, became poor. Why? In order to enrich us through his poverty. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he is God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Who did that? Satan. Eve. He did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, obediently accepting the form of a slave. He was born in the likeness of men. And it was thus that God highly exalted him bestowing upon him the name above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow and every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why did God highly exalt him? Because he humbled. He obediently accepted even death, death on a cross, the worst form of death. Jesus says the servant is no better than his master. Jesus says, where I am, 
there my servant will be. Have a look. There he is. Why? When he began to reveal his, what would happen to him, his passion and death, resurrection, uh, they didn't want it to happen. Remember what Peter said? No, no, Lord, this cannot be. Remember what he said to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. It is necessary that I be lifted up. It is necessary that I be lifted up in order to draw all men to myself. You want to know why it is necessary that you and I be lifted up? That's why. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no gall, no glory, no battle, no victory, period, exclamation point, no other way. If I knew a way, I would tell you. I've been looking for a way for years. No other way. Got to go the way the Master went. It is called the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross, the way of sorrow. That doesn't mean that we have to walk around being visibly sorrowful at every moment. No. Why? Because we know where we're headed. That's why. Oh, we have a lot of pain. We have a lot of suffering. I am not that old, but I have seen much. Many of you have seen a lot more than I have. You've been around longer than I have been. You've seen wars come and go. You've seen children born and children die. You've had great joys and you've had great sorrows. Some of you are great heroes, in my mind. In the end, I think all of you, all of us, will be. And we don't feel like that, but why? Simply because we have walked the path of life. Because we have walked that path as Christians. Because we have endured many sorrows, Oh, some of you say, no, I really haven't. I've had a wonderful life. And my very simple response to you is, ain't over. <laughs> God can do more in a minute than a hundred years of mere human effort. I think my father suffered 20 normal passions in the last few years of his life. My father was a big, strong, athletic man. And I remember him when I was a boy, when he was still in his prime. He could run faster than anybody else. He was stronger than anybody else. He was a great athlete. He had been, he boxed. Semi-pro, they called it in that day. He's really professional for a while. He wasn't that tall, but he was very, very hard to beat. One of the things he taught me, not unimportant, was this. Never quit. Never quit. You might be outclassed, outweighed, outgunned, in every way, never quit. Now, there's a principle here. He was talking to me about boxing and that you're going to get in the ring with guys bigger and stronger and faster than you are. But you must have a certain attitude, and the attitude is this. They will have to kill you in order to win. Very simple. Now, I'm obviously not talking about boxing. 
But I'm talking about an attitude. I'm talking about a very essential attitude in this combat, in this war, which is spiritual and moral more than anything else. Don't be a quitter. I remember the toughest fight that I was ever in in the Golden Gloves. I was almost to the end, really two fights from winning my division for the Northeast, entire Northeast of the United States. And the guy I had to get in the ring with, it with, he was much better than me. He was in a different category. He went on to become a professional boxer. After the first round, I knew that it was going to be a long night. <laughs> and we only fought three rounds. <laughs> Nine minutes can be a very long time. Nine minutes can be an eternity. Your whole life can pass before you. The thought came into my head, you're going to get hurt. Another thought came into my head, why don't you just lay down? <laughs> Discretion is the better part of valor sometimes. Nobody could blame you. And I thought of my father. I could never face my father as a quitter. I could never endure the withering scorn of his gaze if I threw the fight. If I laid down and quit, it would have been much easier to have been beaten to death. <laughs> Don't be a quitter. Very simple lesson. Now, the application of that, well, there are millions of applications. Now, you and I, I, I hope, I pray, that you will have long, happy, prosperous lives. And then you will go singing off to heaven. And there you will be happy forever. But I know for many of us, between here and there, there will be many a trial, many a pain, many a cross. You and I, at times, will be tried to within an inch of our endurance. We will be pushed beyond our endurance in fighting that good fight and running that race to the finish line. You'll be severely tested immersed in the crucible and the fire of testing and purification. God wants to burn off the dross. He wants to see in you the pure gold of his son. He wants to temper you like steel in the fire. He wants to make a mighty sword out of you. And when that sword goes into battle, it better be tempered strong so it doesn't break in combat. That's you. And that's me. Your battle may take the form of cancer. God forbid. Your battle may take the form of some other illness, heart disease. Or your battle may take the form of emotional struggle depression, anxiety. Every bit as difficult as physical suffering may be worse. Your battle may take the form of bereavement and loss. You ever think about how much collective suffering materialized in an instant on September 11th? How many families were plunged into the depths of sorrow, in the twinkling of an eye. Do 
your suffering, your cross may take the form of a moral struggle. Perhaps you have been enslaved to a sin or series of sins for years. Perhaps you hate your sin, but are enslaved to your sin. Oh, it may be drugs. It may be alcohol addiction. It may be pornography. It may be any number of things. And it has a hold on you. And you hate it. And you do anything to overcome it. That can be painful. And God permits it. Why? To bring a greater good out of it. No hero ever became a hero without a struggle. No one ever received the Congressional Medal of Honor without having been one heck of a soldier. Going above and beyond the call of duty, that can take many forms in this battle. It can become complicated and confusing. Don't allow that to happen. Always return to one thought. Come always as a servant. Remember that Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Jesus, who is God, the author and architect of the universe, the master came to serve. Who's the servant? Not to come to serve. And you say, well, how can I do this? In simple ways, in everyday ways. The exhaustion at times is difficult. But so what? It's the mission. Am I exhausted of, as some of you moms have been, up all night with the baby? Hmm? Oh, I bet some of you have been real tired. And I often think, somewhere right now in Afghanistan, the successors of unit I was briefly with, they're in the mountains someplace right now. And it's cold, and it's dark, and it's inhospitable. And they might be hungry, and they're not sure if they'll come home alive. And they're thinking about their wives and children, and moms and dads. And they're thinking about Michigan State winning the game today in the last play. And they couldn't see it. And I say, am I worse off than those guys? No. And when I feel sorry for myself, i got to remind myself, come always as a servant. And when I come to serve, and I'm not appreciated, and perhaps even rejected, and perhaps even persecuted, am I better than the Master? Should my lot be better than his? Come always as a servant. A lot has happened between last year and this year. Since I last saw you at this conference, an awful lot of water has gone under the bridge. Between right now and a year from now, I wonder, I wonder what will happen. I wonder what the state of the world will be a year from now. I wonder how the new kind of war is going to be a year from now. I wonder what new novel form of attack they'll come up with. 
between now and then. In a world of so much uncertainty, there's one thing you can be certain of. Come always as a servant. And you'll never be disappointed. Come always as a servant, and you will have an inner peace and a joy that's hard to describe. If you don't come as a servant, you will be regularly disappointed, discouraged, upset, and angry. For many, many, many times, even those who love you will not fully appreciate you. But there's one thing for certain. God sees everything. There's one thing for certain. No good deed goes unnoticed by the good God. No tear that you could ever shed for injustice, children gone the wrong way, any evil. Those tears are stored up in heaven like treasure, like precious diamonds. God stores them for you. Nothing's lost on God. So as you move forward through life, Come always as a servant. The master will send you from time to time missions. In the army, we used to get a mission. You know, the mission is blow up the bridge. The mission is take the hill. The mission is whatever. Now, God will send you missions from time to time. Last couple of days, maybe the mission for some of you was putting up with me. Oh, no small thing. <laughs> I've had a lot of wives tell me, oh, Father, I love your tapes. I play them all the time. My, father, my, my husband, however, cannot stand the sound of your voice. <laughs> there was one good Irish American lady, she played my tapes incessantly. Uh, and her husband just, he was a decent man, but he couldn't stand the sound of my voice. They went on vacation to visit her relatives in Ireland. They were in County Cork. They hadn't been in the house ten minutes, and from a back room came a voice. And the husband stopped and he said, I know that voice. I know that voice. He's not here, is he? Her great aunt had somehow got a hold of some of my tapes. She's 90 years old playing them in the back room. The old man almost got on the airplane and flew home. In the days of the the old saints, you know, they used to do a lot of penance. And one of the forms of penance is that they wore a hair shirt. Hmm? You know, it was very uncomfortable, scratchy. Nowadays, we don't wear hair shirts anymore. Because now we realize that your hair shirt may be sitting next to you. <laughs> you could even be married to your hair shirt. Yeah, a lot of people rub us the wrong way. <laughs> Come always as a servant. You'll be able to put up with it. Servants do hard things. God will send you missions to serve him. Yeah, maybe today it's putting up with someone. Uh, maybe tomorrow, looking the other way when somebody insults you being a peacemaker when somebody's trying to cause trouble, being kind when it's easy to be mean. Another time the mission will come, delivered in the form of a medical report, the results of a physical that says something wrong. That's a mission from headquarters. Know what you're dealing with. It's a mission from headquarters. On September 12th, I talked to a man who works with me, travels with me, 
periodically. He had been in the Marines. He was an officer in the Marines back in the 60s. We were the same age. Did his tour in Vietnam. He had a, a brother four blocks from the World Trade Center where he lived. I said, Sal, your brother okay? Said, yeah, my brother's okay. What have you been doing? I called the Marines, see if they'd take me back. My age, 54. See if I could get with my unit. Maybe they need me. I said, what'd you do today? I said, I did the same thing. <laughs> they don't have any Catholic chaplains in the United States Army. There's a terrible shortage. And there has been, there's been for years. They'll even waive the age requirement. Normally, you have to be 40 when you receive your commission. Willing to waive it. I had a physical. And my little minor heart condition is twice as bad as they thought it was. Doubled the medication. My blood pressure is more than it should be. Doubled that medication. And I'm mostly deaf in my left ear and about 50% in my right. No place for you in this man's army, fat old guy. <laughs> but there's an old kind of war where you're always useful. There's an old kind of war where the older you get, the more useful you get. Because generally, the older you get, the more aches and pains you have. As my grandma would say, you've got more to offer up, ain't it grand? <laughs> the older that you get, the more mileage you have on you. And like my daddy was like an old car, parts wearing out, left and right. They replace this one, replace that one. Keep him on the road, and he goes a while longer. And there's a dignity in that. There's a power in that. There is a greatness in that, fighting the good fight, running the race to the finish line, knowing beyond any shadow of a doubt that you are contributing to the salvation of your brothers and sisters, quite simply because you're united to Christ. You're one with them. And you don't think you're heroes. You don't feel like great warriors. You feel quite small, if you feel like me. And you feel quite insignificant. And you don't feel capable of any great victories. And you don't think they're ever going to pin a medal on you. And yet, one day, when the dust settles and the smoke of battle is cleared away and time gives way to eternity, you're going to stand before the chief who really matters, the boss, the general who really matters. And then all that hidden fidelity, all the redemptive suffering, all of that then will have its recompense all your rosaries, all your acts of sacrifice and charity. You know, it's all being stored up for you. Not that you're trying to get anything for yourself, but you can't outdo the good God in generosity. Our priests, most of them hidden, quietly working, faithfully, unheralded, good moms and dads, good religious sisters, getting very little credit now for lives of total sacrifice. Oh, I know a lot of sisters who could have been brain surgeons. Oh, yeah, they're that intelligent. Oh, they could have fly right, flown right through their education. I know 
I literally know a cardiologist who's a Carmelite nun now, another one who was a Wall Street lawyer, no money, no power, no prestige. By the world's standards, no success. And yet the words of Mother Teresa come back to us. God doesn't need your success, only your fidelity. Only your fidelity. One day at a time, one hour at a time, everything you do, do it for the Lord. Come as his servant and the servant of your brothers and sisters. If you're washing the floor, changing the diapers, whatever, do it perfectly. Who are you doing it for? Jesus, I hope. And because of that, you will be contributing to the war effort. Because of that, you'll be bringing down grace on creation. Because of that, wisdom will be infused into our leaders. Because of that, charity will once again flourish in our society. Because of that, impurity will be driven out. Evil will give place to good. Lies will be vanquished by truth. The darkness will be pushed out by that light against which the darkness could not, cannot, and will not prevail. This is an absolute irrefutable truth. My brothers and sisters, I don't know when or if I'll ever see some of you again in this life. But I do know that if you remain faithful, if you will run this race to the finish line, if you will fight this good fight, coming as a servant, always as a servant, one day, one day you and I together are going to be very happy. One day you and I together will rejoice for all eternity, clothed with the mantle of light that is the reward for God's friends. One day indeed, when time gives way to eternity, and you and I stand before God, you're going to hear the word. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joy of your master's heart. God loves you. God bless you. And goodbye.